So I'm going to talk to you today about what happens. Um, I'm a physicist, as you just heard, not, not a geophysicist. Um, what happens when you go looking inside granular materials? Um, and of course, this is a lot easier to do in the lab than it is to do out in the field. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about stuff I've done with so many wonderful collaborators and students and postdocs over the years. Um, and we will get to what that picture uh, on the screen is of in just a minute. Um, but that is us looking inside granular materials. All right. So to start, um, you know, there are dense granular materials. This is no news to you guys, um, you know, all over Earth and planetary systems. Um, and you know, I just put some pictures up here that have given me inspiration um, over the years. Um, you know, I think I first saw the picture of the San Andreas Fault with the broken fence line in my ninth grade textbook and was just, you know, utterly impressed by it at the time. Um, and, you know, I didn't work on that problem for a very, very long time, but it stuck with me. Um, and, you know, I love looking around the world and, you know, wondering how patterns, you know, form in nature, why things, some are wavy or curvy or striped um, and things like that. And so um, understanding all of these systems for me, I, I know as, as a geoscientist, people tend to study one of these, right? Uh, and I tend to abstract things and just talk about, you know, the granular material itself, um, although that is changing as I, as I learn more and more. Um, and so, I mean, Doug Gerald is on the call um, as well. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of similarities between what um, soft condensed matter physicists do and what Earth scientists do. Um, it's an, only a matter of time scale, right? Um, so, you know, when you know, people go and look at how the Earth has changed over time, um, you know, a lot of the things that are seen are stuff that people see in the lab on shorter time scales and some much smaller length scales. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, you have people almost uncertain, undoubtedly at your universities um, who are soft condensed matter physicists. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to them um, and, you know, team up and make collaborations. And so this is sort of a map um, that Doug and I made to hopefully inspire people um, that if you look at, you know, granular flows out in the earth and, you know, physicists call it packing fraction, you can say this is loose packed to dense packed, right? These are things that are mostly interstitial and not much grains up to here that has more grains, right? And as you shear it harder and harder, and we're using a non-dimensionalized shear rate here, so this, um, but you can think of these as faster flows to the right and slower flows to the left, right? Then all over um, you know, the Earth's surface, there are things that are flowing and you know, in some ways, many ways seem soft. And by soft, I mean they deform over the time scale that you're interested in, right? Um, and you know, squeezing out ketchup, you're interested on the time scale of your hunger. Right, um, but let me show you what squeezing out ketchup looks like um, on a geological time scale. Um, and so this is not ketchup, just full disclosure. Um, this is a uh, Slumgullion um, Earth flow in Colorado. And these are some satellite images that postdoc in my group, Michael Despende put together. Um, so this is cycling through four satellite images that had relatively clear days between 2019 and 2022. And, you know, this looks like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube, right? <laughs> this, you know, if I didn't, if you didn't know that these were trees, <laughs> right? You know, you actually might, if you don't know the time scale, you might think this was a river, right? But, you know, the, the earth is flowing and is deforming on time scales that, that matter to us as humans. And these are techniques that I have that I use in the lab can be applied here. Okay. Um, so some... You know, of course, the time scales vary widely, right? And so here's an you know, example of something very slow versus very fast. And I think even my definition of very slow is not that slow. Um, but you know, this is a picture I took last summer uh, in the Andes. And these are farming terraces um, that were created by the Incas. Um, and the Inca Empire fell in 1572. So um, this is 550 years of creep in which those terraces um, got you know, sort of smoothed out and erased you know, through um, probably both erosion and creep. Okay, um, and then a more recent and you know horrible example on the you know the earthquake this past year, um, this year in Turkey, um, where you know a very localized fault you know had a very finite displacement um, over you know a very short time scale with tremendous destruction. Right, um, and so there's lots of places for these very and these are both very dense densely packed materials. The the interactions are dominated by the grains, right, not by fluids. Um, and although fluids are obviously present, um, and what sets those dynamics? Okay, and this is the same boundary, um, you know, very similar boundary between something that's creeping and becomes a landslide. 
Okay, and so that's the problem that I'm gonna get us thinking about first, then I'm gonna do a bunch of stuff in the lab, and then we're gonna come back to this same idea again at the end and see what we learned in the lab might apply to this. Um, so the figure at right, um, sorry, figure at left, let's start, um, is INSAR um, displacement fields um, taken by Al, Al Handwerger for the Mud Creek um, landslide that happened in 2017. Um, and so white is not much happening, green is a little bit, is a lot happening, pink is in the middle. And you start to see, and you see throughout this time period leading up to it, um, to failure, you see you know, speckles of activity, right? Um, that culminate in the very large flow that you see on the right. Um, let me play that again, in which you know a very large chunk of a mountain um, comes down um, and lands um, in the Pacific Ocean, right? And just for scale, this is Route Highway One across here, <laughs> right? So this is a very, very large amount of Earth, you know, incredibly destructive, um, and you know, likely rainfall. Um, was involved. Um, there had been a period of drought followed by a period of heavy rain. Um, but you know, as the climate changes, right, and as we get more of these large rainfalls, is this something we should be more worried about? You know, can we say at what spots on uh, the earth um, we should be worried about these sorts of things happening? Um, and as a physicist, you know, what is the triggering mechanism that causes this to go from stable to unstable? I and mean, it was stable for a very long time before it was unstable. Um, and so that's the question that interests me is a lot, is that, you know, being able to forecast where and when changes in behavior are going to happen. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to give you how physicists think of rigidity. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think all of us, you know, you know, took enough physics of, as, you know, even if it was just as bachelor students, right, that if you want to solve for, you know, some object uh, being rigid or being floppy, um, and floppy is a technical term um, in physics community, um, that you want to count up how many constraints you have and how many unknowns you have, right? And if you have enough constraints to satisfy your degrees of freedom, it's rigid. And if you don't, you know, then you if you lose out another torque or force balance, things are floppy, okay? But there's a caveat here that it matters how things are configured. So this little movie here is to show you just sort of a simple picture frame example, right? That if I move the one of the purple beams from the left to the right side, right, I can change whether that right side is floppy or rigid. Same number of beams connected to the same number of points. This is like a little simple bridge construction, you know, to give to intro civil engineering students, right? But where I put the beams matters. It's not just about the number of beams per unit area, right? So taking averages can be dangerous because how things are configured changes whether something is floppy or rigid, okay? Also how well connected they are and things too, but even if for the same number of things, it does matter, okay? And so this is what I want us to keep in mind as we start to ask ourselves when, when and where, you know, failures are going to happen. Um, all right, and the th I'm gonna use three different frameworks during this talk, um, and I'm sort of arranged them here from, more, from less physics to more physics. Um, and so I'm going to use um, network science tools. These are the same ones that are used for like friendship networks and transportation networks, right? Epidemiological networks, right? So there's applied mathematicians who have tons and tons of network science tools um, that we can adapt, okay? And they're great in part because they have less physics. You need to know less about your system. And when you don't know the interactions, like you often don't within a very large um, geophysical system, I think they might be very helpful. Um, a little bit more physics, we're going to go to this constraint counting idea that just is, you know, you know, just about bridge, you know, trusses and bridges. If you count up how many equations, how many unknowns, do you have enough to settle um, the facts? Okay. So there's a bit of physics in there. Okay. Um, and then the most physics is to talk about vibrational mode. So what are the dynamics of the system within that? Okay. And I'll go through all of these as we go along, but I want you to keep in mind that there's sort of a hierarchy here of how much you need to trust and how much you need to know. So our question is how do grains uh, resist stresses? Okay, and so the movie on the left is is, is uh, taken at high speeds. So we're covering a few seconds. You know, seconds are ticking by very slowly, and this is sort of a zoom in of an experiment like this one. Okay, and every place that's bright, think of that as carrying force. I will tell you what's going on here in just a minute. Okay, but essentially we're ramping up force on this inner wheel. So we're ramping up the torque, and at some point it's going to catastrophically fail. Okay. And that is coming just about now. Okay, and that inner wheel moves 
and there was your earthquake or your landslide. Okay. Um, and so grains are resisting stresses by inner particle forces that are carried from their inner wheel to the outer wheel. If you want to think about this as you know the fault gouge, you know, in a fault, um, just sort of wrapped around so that we can run continuously, that's a fine thing to think about. I mean, these are not direct analogs of the of Earth systems. Um, but the point is it resists increasing load up until a point, and then it can do nothing about it. Okay. And I'm gonna play it again this time. And this time I want you to watch that there actually are small changes going on there throughout. So the particles are not moving, the particles are basically stationary, okay. But they're rearranging the forces, those bright patches, okay, in order to accommodate the load. Okay. Um, and you see some flickering here, right? There was another bit, you know, here it's sort of you know twitched within there, rearranged a bit. Okay. So there's small changes, very small changes to the positions of the particles, and there are more dramatic changes to the inner particle forces leading up to failure. And at some point, here it comes, it just can't do anything anymore. Okay, so what's going on there? I'm gonna stop sharing for a second so that I'm big. Um, and I'm gonna, pin, I think I can pin myself so you guys can see me. All right, so here's what you were looking at. <laughs> this is a box of little plastic beads. Um, since I can't hand them to you, think of them as little um, pencil erasers. They're about that stiffness, about that size, um, but they're clear, they're polyurethane. They're the same thing as in your bike seats and car seats. Um, and when I push on it, I, over here, uh, there we go, there we go. All right, I can, I can visualize where the forces are. So if I push on this side, I get forces over here. If I push on this side, I get forces over here. So this gives me a non-invasive way to see what's going on inside my system as long as I'm willing to work in two dimensions, which is a bit of a compromise. All right, so let me go back to showing the screen again. There we go. And let's see how that works. What, what's, this, what's this magic that I'm using? Um, so this is just polarized light. And I think the people who work with rock thin sections know this um, already, um, but you may not know that polymers just almost universally uh, are birefringent. Um, they rotate the polarization of light in a relationship with how much stress you have put on them. And so if I put um, a birefringent particle between two circular polarizers that have opposite polarization, then light shouldn't be able to get through. That's this low force case here. Okay, as I increase the force on those disks, the, right, the light is rotated by the um, birefringence of the disk. And so now, even though it was left circular light coming in, it's been rotated a little bit. So now it can partially get through the right uh, circular polarizer. And that's a medium amount of force. You get a nice bright spot there where the stresses are highest. Okay, if I rotate too far, then it can't get through again. Um, and so you start to see these fr repeating fringes. Okay, and so we actually have a full quantitative understanding of this. Um, when we are willing to work hard, which isn't all the time, sometimes we're willing to work hard, sometimes we just do quick and dirty, but when we're willing to work hard, we can take images of all of those particles um, in our experiment. We know 19th century elasticity and 19th century optics, or if we don't, we can look them up in a book, um, and we can do an optimization problem to figure out what the vector contact forces are, we're calling it here the pseudo image, that would have given rise to those green patterns. And so from that, we get the vector contact forces at every particle. If we want to get the full stress field and pressure field, the stress tensor, continual mechanics, we can do that if we want to. Okay, and we, these are some review articles where these methods are discussed. So this is, you know, this is really um, state-of-the-art 1940s technology um, hooked up to an optimization scheme that, that's much more modern. Okay, um, and these chains, these, these patterns have sometimes been called force chains. Um, by the end of the talk, I think you'll know why maybe I don't want to call them that so much, um, although that is what they're called. Um, and basically, if you go out in the world and look at matter that's made up of other little bits of matter, and if someone has gone and looked for these structures, they have seen them. Um, so everything from you know micron scale colloids to hard frictional glass particles, these photoelastic particles, emulsions, think of these as mayonnaise, right? Um, the um, aqua gel beads you put into um, flower arrangements and diapers. Um, basically, whenever you have an arrangement of matter that is exposed to some um, you know, stress or strain, they're going to form these chain like structures through which the forces are carried. And they are very heterogeneous, okay? And they're very sensitive to, to the small details of how you arrange things. So let me tell you about that, okay? Um, 
But oh yeah, I forgot I was gonna tell you this first, <laughs> which is this is not a new concept. <laughs> um, this is Isaac Newton um, trying to understand um, in Latin um, why uh, um, fluids flow, you know, origins of viscosity essentially, right? And he's talking about little bits of fluid um, and Newton, in fact, recognized that if you had little bits of fluid pushing on each other at some point, if there wasn't another particle directly to push on, you'd have to split. You know, this is Newton's laws, right? You'd have to split that force into two other places in order to have the sum of the forces on particle E being zero, right? And so the idea that any that a particulate matter ought to have this behavior is actually quite old, although Newton was reasoning about fluids, which do not have this behavior. Um, he would have been right for complex fluids. Um, and in fact, how you have loaded the material um, will change what those patterns of the forces are. They record the history of how, uh, of the sample. And I think this could be really important in geological contexts because we're often interested in the strain history and the stress history um, of a material. So on the left, um, this is from Bob Berenger's group, um, his student, uh, Trish Majmudar, um, put together a, a really lovely study that detailed how the statistics of those chains differ when you're working under compression versus under shear, okay? Um, and so the structures, so by eye, you might have difficulty telling these two apart, but when you're looking at the stresses, you can easily tell them apart, okay? And it's actually not just the stresses um, that are different um, under compression versus shear. Um, in fact, um, if you also look at how locally packed <laughs> the grains are, so how much free space they have around them locally, um, there's actually some variability in that as well. Um, and so this is work um, done in my group. The, the lead author was Efren Billalang, and he was looking at, this is actually what I'm telling you here is not the main point of the paper, but an important point for us today, um, that depending on how you load the sample, right, um, you're going to, and these green histograms are plots of how likely it has some particular free volume, so this is one minus the packing fraction um, versus some pressure. What you see is that sheared systems have a very characteristic, this is actually volume preserving shear, so they have a characteristic free volume, but the pressure changes as you um, shear it. Okay, if you do biaxial compression, of course, as you compress it, the uh, amount of free volume goes down and the pressure goes up, right? So that makes sense. Okay, uniaxial is somewhere in between the two. It's a mixture of biaxial and shear. And in fact, you don't see a line halfway between those two you see both lines. So this is for clusters of eight particles. <laughs> so it looks like uniaxial, you know, some motion that's being compressed in one direction locally is accommodated by one of those two processes, okay? And so this is, as any granular material is affected by stresses and strains, right? It's gonna be doing some combination of these things internally, okay? And I also told you these are very sensitive to small changes. So you're gonna probably at some point, if you haven't already, objected to the fact that I'm using circles and there are very, very few circular particles out in the world. So I wanna assure you that my particles are not circles, okay? Um, they look like circles, <laughs> um, but if you, these look, I know these look like lovely circles, right? If you repeat the same experiment over and over again, and same is of course in quotes, right? By opening one of the walls and putting the particles back again, okay? What you will see is that the force chains show up in slightly different arrangements each time. Okay, they're sensitive to the small ways in which it was loaded. Okay, and one of the important things for this is that if you were actually to go in and take a micrograph of one of these particles, what I'm showing you now is the deviations from a perfect circle, right? So for these particles, we have about plus or minus 1% on the radius, okay? But that could be large. I don't. I mean, one percent doesn't seem large, right? But if you have two bumpy particles that are close to in contact, whether their high points are meeting or their low points are meeting, could be the difference between being in contact or not. Okay. So yes, my particles look like circles, but they're actually rough and they're actually real, um, and you know they actually know that they are real and that they the details of their contact matter. All right. Um, I'm going to tell you now about some of the things we do with these and what we learn. Um, so those were sort of so, so phenomena that I want you to have in mind. And now what do you use that to talk about rigidity? So that I promised you one of the techniques we were going to use was just to do plain old network science like these were, you know, social networks. Okay. And so what does that mean? That means we take our particles, we give them each a numbered name. These are called nodes. If two particles are uh, in contact, that's called an edge um, in graph theory. We can write this as a graph representation. 
right? And then the standard way that uh, mathematicians then take this is they write what's called an adjacency matrix. So you list all the particles down the left and across the top. And if they're in contact, it's a one. If they're not in contact, it's a zero. You also could decide to weight them, for instance, by the force, okay? And if you can write your data in this format, which is to say these objects are connected to those objects by some weight or not weight, then you have at your disposal a gazillion options developed <laughs> out in the world of network science, okay? And the question is, what do you want to know about your network? So here are just some examples, right? Do you want to know about global properties? Like, so how is it globally efficient at doing something? Do you want to partition it up into domains where these guys are more attached to each other than they are to those guys, right? So these are friend groups, <laughs> right? Um, do you want to look for um, which routes get you from this to there as efficiently as possible, right? And which routes are the most popular routes, right? So this right here in red is the Chicago O'Hare of, <laughs> right? This is the place where all flights, it's either, you know, if you're going from East Coast to West, you're going through O'Hare or through Houston, good chance, right? So these are those airline hubs, okay? Um, or are you looking at local clustering? Can you form triangles, which we know are stable, right? So there's lots and lots of techniques out there. I've given a mixture of sort of, of you know, physical interpretations and, you know, sort of social or technological ones, because people use them for lots of different methods. But essentially, if you have a question, somebody has probably written an algorithm to do it well. Um, and the one I want to tell you about first actually comes from an example of interdisciplinarity from the brain connectivity toolbox, right? Because that's what they were first written for and written in an open source way. And so that's what we used, even though there is no brain here. Um, so this is the question, if I've got a bunch of particles, and I say, what's the shortest path between all pairs of particles? And then each other particle gets a vote for how many times it's been on one of those paths. Eventually you'll discover that some particles are just really popular. Lots of short paths go with them. So these are the Chicago O'Hare's of the world. Okay, And this quantity is called betweenness centrality. Okay, It doesn't mean it's centrally located in um, physical space. It means it's really central to, it's on a lot of paths. Okay. And one of the things we discovered is it's really important to understand this for understanding which parts of a network are very prone to failure, okay? Um, so this is not a granular experiment for the moment. Um, we actually tried to do this in grains, it was hard, and so we backed off. Um, and we basically took our granular force chains, wrote down the contact network, and then cut it out of plastic. <laughs> and then we did experiments on the plastic, and this is the work of Estelle Bertier. And the advantage is when plastic breaks, you know it broke. And so you can track failures a lot easier. Okay. And the question is, where are the failures going to happen? Okay. And so here's an example of one of those um, failing under compression. This is distributed failure, right? It's it's breaking up, you know, all over, um, not in a nice crack-like structure. Although we have when we have more connections, it does behave like that. Um, this is one that's very distributed, so more ductile than brittle. Okay. And one of the things we discovered. And now I'm playing a similar movie, but now I'm marking it with this betweenness value. So yellow places are ones that have a high score on this betweenness, and blue are places that have a low score. Um, and what we see is that those red failure locations are falling on that yellow network most of the time. So even though this looked like it was sort of just a network of a bunch of forced, okay, these are not forced chains really, they're plastic now, right? They're plastic forced chains. And even though that was fairly uniform, right? we can detect the most likely places to failure by these really simple network statistics. Okay. Um, if we do a better model, we can get a better prediction, but I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Um, the point there is that a really simple model works really, really well. Um, so now we start looking at grains. Okay. And this is the experiment that motivated the previous one and that we couldn't make predictions in yet. We're still working on it, okay? In the meantime, we decided to go look at rigidity, which is an, turned out to be an easier question than failure, okay? Um, and now I'm gonna tell you the two other methods that physicists use to, have, use to understand where a region or a system might be rigid, okay? Um, so the first one has the same idea of, you know, from introductory physics that, you know, if you look at the particles in a box, you count up, how many contacts you have, and you count up that there's uh, one rotational and two translational degrees of freedom for each particle, and you sort of match to see, do I have enough uh, force components to cover all of my degrees of freedom, okay? 
that's a hard thing to do with lots and lots of equations <laughs> for a large number of particles. Okay, And so mathematicians have developed something called the pebble game, which basically you represent like the network I showed you. And each particle has three pebbles for its three degrees of freedom. Um, and it has bonds that say either whether that's one constraint, whether it's a rolling or a slide, a slipping versus a um, frictional constraint. Um, and you try to, and you basically it's like the game of game of go. There's a game you play to move your pebbles around to see if you have enough um, constraints to satisfy your degrees of freedom. And if you do, you can find clusters of particles where the rigidity is satisfied. Okay. Um, second way we think about rigidity is. Um, you know, I'm going to use an example here. I play the cello. We're going to use the cello as an example, right? Um, but I think many people have seen people playing stringed instruments, tightening and loosening the strings, <laughs> right? Um, as you tighten the string, it gets stiffer, right? More rigid, and it goes to higher pitch, right? As you loosen the string, um, it gets floppier, and it goes to lower pitch, okay? So the idea here is that the vibrational modes of the system tell you how stiff versus floppy it is, okay? And that was just one string. We have a whole collection of vibrational <laughs> modes in a large system, okay? Um, and these are no longer just particle in a potential well. We've got friction, dissipation, right? We've got lots going on, okay? So if you are friends with good theoretical physicists, and you know mine are Jen Schwartz and Zilke Henkes, um, they will go ahead and sort of write the equivalent harmonic well for this highly dissipative system. Okay, and then go say, we're gonna go looking for places that have relatively low displacement around the low energy modes. Okay, and those are places that are probably rigid. Okay. Um, and so let me just give some examples to show what this means. So as we change the number, as we, this is experiments as we sheared the system. Okay, so ABCD is applying more shear to the system. Okay. Um, what we start to see, we start to looking for what the eigenvalues, so what the frequencies were, and we saw a nice place to divide the stiff modes from the floppy modes, and we drew that line. Okay, so now we can classify things, and every place that here that's purple is some place that is rigid, and every place is gray that's some place that's floppy. And so let me tell you how we did the experiment. I, I, I forgot to tell you on the movie. So you, you can see on the movie here, we sheared and then we unsheared, right? So we, I'll, I'll play it again, right? We sheared. We get force chains this way, we unsheared and we erased them. Okay. And so that's, we're looking for regions within there that are rigid. Okay. And obviously it's not very rigid in the beginning. And as you shear it, it stiffens up. And so that's what we see here that as you shear it, it gradually stiffens up. Okay. So picture on the left is what the force chains look like. Picture in the middle is what we found to be rigid if we use the sort of energy landscape idea. Okay. What this is called a Hessian matrix. Um, and if we use the constraint counting one, so this is basically just torque and force balance, what we got is rigid clusters. Um, so I'm going to argue that, two, that the, these two pictures, these two methods give very similar pictures, right? Approximately the same regions were designated as either being stiff, which is colored in, or gray, which is floppy. They're not perfectly the same, but they're very close. And they're very close, particularly we consider with our completely different methods, right? And they're both methods that make a lot of approximations, and yet they still work. And the third observation I want to make is try as you might, it's very difficult, and we have been unsuccessful in doing so, even using statistics, at guessing which parts of these force chains are the rigid clusters. <laughs> okay, and I'll give you guys a moment to stare at that. Okay, but there's force chains everywhere here. Okay, and if we look at correlations between average pressure, it's weakly correlated, but not strongly correlated with where those rigid clusters appear. So the, I want you guys to think of these rigid clusters as being mesoscale structures. So it's not the individual force chains that are giving it rigidity, it's the force network that's giving it rigidity. It's a mesoscale thing, okay? And it's not about the average force, it's not about the average force chain density, it's not about you being a particularly strong chain, okay? It's about how much you're held up by your neighbors, okay? And that's what these are all. These are all collective effects from the neighbors, okay? And this is impossible to see in a system that hasn't been designed to use clever particles that tell you where the forces are. Okay, so this is a downside of this method, but we learn things from it. So let me tell you what we learned from it. Okay, I'll, actually, I'll show you the movie first. So this is now a movie of the shear and then unshear. And so you see that the clusters are very well, I mean, the colors are arbitrary, but the, the clusters are very well 
correlate with each other as you share it and then as you unshare. Okay, it, it does a nice job all the way through. Okay, and if we correlate the fraction of particles that are in the two methods, both for share and for unshare, they're extremely well correlated. So what we'd love to be true, because it would be wonderful and it would mean we understood things, was that the floppy regions forecast the failure locations. This is what I would love to be true. Um, I don't get to decide that, however. Um, we have some evidence, however, that it's not a terrible idea. Okay, and so this is the weak evidence <laughs> um, that's very intriguing, which is that going back to the plastic ones, the ones that we cut out of plexiglass, so this is the network of force chains cut out of plexiglass. This also, we can run the pebble game on and detect the rigid clusters. There's lots of them, lots of ones in bits and pieces, okay? And then the red circles are all the places where failures occurred when we were fracturing it, okay? And I think that near, you know, it's about, 75 to 80% of the failures fall along <laughs> these regions that were floppy, okay? And the rigid ones, and there are no circles that fall deep within a rigid cluster, okay? This is one example, okay? It's not a granular material, okay? But it's certainly provocative, okay, that there is a relationship between where materials fail, okay, and where these mesoscopic structures either exist or don't exist. And so this is a hypothesis to be tested. All right. So we are going to now go back to the network methods. And um, you know, at this point, I'm going to say we, we have not yet actually tested this in a granular material. Um, it's a very difficult thing to test, need a lot of statistics. And so we've sort of, we took a break from that and went um, in a slightly different direction, which is to say, you know, Network methods were really successful when you don't have all of the information you want. So maybe we should be using them um, before, you know, before we can do a full rigidity percolation calculation on enough data to detect this, let's back off and do something easier. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how network scientists um, detect communities and then two ways in which they are useful both in physics experiments, but then also out on field data. Okay, so this is, um, geological data will come to a minute, but I'm just going to use it as a picture to describe things. So you can make something called a multi-layer network. So you might think of this as being a friendship network in 2019, in 2020, and then in 2021. Okay, so this is a layer of networks for who's friends with whom, advancing in time. Okay, and so you have connections of one type within the plane, and then temporal connections down the road. Okay, it doesn't have to be time, okay, but that, those are the applications that we're talking about for the moment, okay. And what we want to do is look for, let's say, persistent friend groups. So these people are not only friends right now, but that friendship group persi persists through time. It managed to cross the pandemic or it didn't cross the pandemic, for instance, okay. So we want some resolution knobs, right? So we want to sort of get this thing into focus, right? So am I someone who, am I looking for sort of the broadest groups, so I don't. Want, I want to sort of zoom out and be. I'm just looking for broad categories. Okay, that means setting this resolution res parameter to be low, or am I looking for the fine details? Right. So this is like zooming in and out with a microscope, right, or coming into focus. Okay. I also can say how strongly do I want to connect things in time. So if I was friends with you in 2019, right. Do I really want to strongly bias that I'm going to stay connected to you in 2020 and 2021, or I want to unbiased? Okay. So I have these two knobs, a temporal one and a spatial one. Okay. And we're going to use a method that goes and finds communities. And you can tune these knobs up and down to figure out what you're looking for. Okay. And we know what we're looking for, which is communities of grains that are going to behave in possibly a rigid or possibly a floppy way. So the way this is done is you take your adjacency matrix, okay, that mathematical object I said where you write down who's connected to who and how strongly, and now this has a third dimension in time, okay, and that's this number here. And you're going to say, I have a null model. On average, everybody's connected to the people in their geographic neighborhood. So the, in my box of greens, you're connected to the, the ones you're actually touching. How strong you're connected, who knows? So you're connected on average by the average force, but that's all you know. So that's your null model, okay? Um, and that the null model over here is that you're connected to yourself in the next network, right? That's a base guess, right? So this is sort of 
The physics of our system is that particles can only touch their neighbors and that you stay yourself. That's not many ingredients, <laughs> okay? And then the only two things we can tune are these two knobs, okay? So if we get them tuned up, okay, which basically says things that are higher than average force tend to be lumped into communities. Things that are lower than average force tend to be split, okay? That's sort of the only ingredient we control. We can partition our network up into communities, okay? And so that's what Farnaz has done on data like what I just showed you in the movie that started it. Okay, so we looked for communities of force chains, okay, that were more strongly connected to each other than they were to other particles, okay. And so just as a schematic, you know, in some layer, you might have two communities and later on, you know, this blue one might break into a green one and a blue one, right, that that splits up because a force chain broke. Okay, and we saw those small changes happening, okay. So you can run this algorithm on the force chain data, okay, and there's a couple of things you might characterize. So you might be interested in the size of communities. So what's the spatial attempt, you know, and these might be our rigid clusters, although we're not formally saying they are. Um, what's the, how many particles are in that community or how strong is that community? Is it a stronger than average force? Is it, they have a lot of strong forces or just a bunch of weak forces, right? And the last thing I want to turn our eyes to is volatility. So how much the layers are changing, so how much the communities are changing as you go from layer to layer, right? So did, you know, during the course of the pandemic, did we totally change our friend groups or were they persistent? Okay. And so volatility is a measure of how, how, how fickle we were in our friendships or how fickle the particles were in staying in the same community. Okay. So I want everyone to vote for themselves for a second. Which of these you think is the important effect in forecasting the loss of rigidity? You don't have to share. If we were in a room, I'd make you raise your hands but this can be private voting. All right, so if we do that, okay, um, I'm first gonna tell you one that works and I'll tell you what happens with the other ones. Okay, so we take our pictures, we, we sort of break them down into um, a backbone of forces, we find the communities, and as we go towards one of these failure events, which happen repeatedly of different sizes and intermittently, we can sort of average, we can basically recenter the data over each you know, these are again like landslides or earthquakes, okay? And if we were just looking at the average brightness of the picture, so that's what we looked at initially, right? We saw the force chains get brighter and then fail, right? That's the blue line. So right around zero on average, force chains get brighter and then get dimmer, okay? And it's actually fairly symmetric in time, <laughs> right? Um, if we plot the volatility of those communities, okay? That also rises. And it rises long before the forces actually started to look that different, okay? So there's that flickering that you guys saw in the early movie is real, okay? That flickering is an indication that we're nearing a change in rigidity, okay? And you might think this makes sense because particles that are close to losing rigidity, sorry, systems that are close to losing rigidity, the particles themselves may be close to their frictional failure criteria and they're slipping slightly, the rate gets distributed someplace else but at some point it can't do that anymore, okay? Um, we also often see fluctuations leading up to critical points um, in physics. Um, and so that we're maybe not so surprised by this um, on its own, okay? So I started with volatility. Um, in fact, that's not where we started. We started thinking that size or strength would be important. Um, and so we can redo this average where we weight the data by size and strength and see if it matters. Okay. And the answer is that volatility alone is the strongest signal. <laughs> Weighting by either the size or the strength of the communities only makes things worse, doesn't make things better. Okay, so why would that be? And why were we so wrong? Okay, well, I want to bring us back to the idea I said that we don't want to think about force chains. We want to think about force networks, clusters. Okay, so this is a picture drawn by Farnaz as a cartoon to illustrate this. So if you try to stack up a bunch of balls in the air, the only reason they're gonna stay is because they have support from the side, right? And those might be weak supports, but it's the particle, the weak supports on the sides are what are actually stabilizing the force chains and stabilizing the networks. And this is why it's very tough to see from just a picture of the force chains where these rigid clusters are, right? Is because it's, it's the side branches, it's our support network that holds us up, right? Okay, so the weak chains really, really matter. So that's a granular material in the lab, okay? Um, how about for real landslide? 
<laughs> so I opened telling you about Mud Creek um, and you know this incredibly dramatic event that happened. Okay. And you know, we now live in an era where there's terrific INSAR and terrific rainfall data and lots and lots of data. So we can actually take this data and put it into a multi-layer network. And like I said, the advantage of network science is you need to know a, not, a lot less to be able to make good progress, okay? And so I think those techniques, which we've validated as working in the lab, have a great deal of promise for Earth systems, okay? Um, so this is the data um, that grad student um, Brenda Desai was working on, our collaborator Al Hanwerger, who's the INSAR expert at JPL. Um, so here's the region that failed, it's called Mud Creek. Um, this is about an hour south of Big Sur, California. And here's three other regions um, that I'm just gonna call region one, two, and three. Uh, they were picked because they had similar slopes and region one was located on the coast like Mud Creek was, um, but they're sort of just control regions, okay? And here is what the RMS velocity looks like from the INSAR, okay, in the time leading up to failure, okay? And I wanna point out that there were, these are, these are the rainy seasons that happened, okay? Um, so a couple of things are interesting in this. One is that um, all four of these regions were getting approximately the same rain, not exactly, okay? And they were also in pretty similar fluctuations in their velocity, okay? Not identical, but they were, they were lots and lots of fluctuations going on in all four of these regions, and only one of them failed. And that was mug, okay? So can we understand what we think might've been going on there? Okay, and so we're gonna use that same technique that I talked about earlier, which is multi-layer community detection. So now we're gonna figure out how we populate this, this network, which is that we have our digital elevation model. We put a disordered grid on it. We have our velocity maps from INSAR. And there's two effects. And I'm gonna put in only two pieces of physics here. And they're really small. Actually, there's three pieces. One is you're next to your neighbors, which is almost not physics, okay? So that's one piece of information. You're connected to your neighbors, that's these bars. And we're gonna weight those bars by two tiny pieces of physics. One, if the material was always already flowing, it's got a flowy rheology, we weight it by that. <laughs> so that's evidence of the state of the material. It's not a good rheological measurement, but if it's currently flowing, we're gonna guess it's flowy, right? And the second thing we're gonna say is we're gonna weight by the topography, so how steep it is. So if it's steeper, that's worse, right? So we just multiply the magnitude of the velocity from INSAR times the slope from the digital elevation model, and that goes into our multi-layer network. And then the same Gen Louvain modularity maximization will break this up into communities. So let me show you what those look like. Um, so which areas even have reliable community detection? So blobby things are, are big, strong communities. And of our four regions, actually region three turned out to not really show up um, so much here. Um, it's a little bit down here, but it's not that dramatic, but the greenish region is the greenish region, the bluish region is the bluish region, the pinkish region is the pinkish region, and Mud Creek is in black. So all of these are showing similar burstiness that stuff is happening in sort of reliability of community detection. Um, and this is a movie of what that looks like, which maybe some people might like more. So this is again, the two years leading up to the 2017 landslide. Um, and what you're gonna see is that the community detection is not perfectly, you know, it's not perfectly consistent. Stuff's coming and going, right? Um, but as it goes on, it more and more reliably detects that this Mud Creek area <laughs> is a strongly correlated community, okay? The other regions sort of come and go more. Okay, so we need to make some summary statistics that helps us look at all of this, you know, two dimensions in time data, okay. Um, and so the metric we developed was then called community persistence, which is called pi, capital pi. Um, and so we looked at the ratio normalized by the number of nodes um, of how many are in some community um, during some layer, okay. Um, that's C, and that's the number in that community, okay. And then we looked at how many are present both in this layer and the next layer. So it stayed in the same community from layer to layer. So the node is remaining in the same community over time, that makes this number go up. If the node is switching communities over time, that makes this number go down, okay? So it's just a metric of how, how persistent the nodes are knowing which community they're in. 
And in this case, we found this is a quite good forecaster of failure. So the black line is how you would traditionally maybe measure this, which is what's the cumulative displace, displacement of the landslide over time. Okay. And while it was accelerating throughout this whole two-year period, there's no point in here that really looks different than any other point. Okay. Um, again, the blues are the rainfalls. Okay. The community persistence, on the other hand, is sort of just you know wandering around a mean value and then really skyrockets in the time immediately before failure. Okay. So this is one example from one landslide <laughs> in one geologic location. Okay. Um, and we, of course, are starting to do work to do this on a larger data set now, okay? Um, those works are not ready to be shown in public. Um, but we are starting to see that, in fact, at least for this one case, the network is able to forecast when something will happen, okay? It rises above it, but also where, right? Because what we saw was that after some period of time, Mud Creek was being really well identified as a strong community, okay? There are other regions that also have been flagged as areas of concern, and I would not buy real estate there. Okay. <laughs> All right, I want to close with one last thing, um, which is that everything I've told you, um, almost everything except the last thing, is stuff we can only do in the lab. Okay, that re re requires us to use laboratory methods um, that are not terribly accessible out in the field. So I wanna add one more thing, which is something that I think we have a hope of being able to take out in the field. And this is, was developed um, first um, when Ted Brzezinski uh, was a postdoc on my lab. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what he found and why I think it's interesting. So that same experiment I showed you where we're shearing towards failure, okay? Um, he had the whole outside of it hooked up with, you guys can think of them as seismometers or geophones. They were little piezoelectric sensors, okay? And they were listening all the time, okay? And why did he do this? Well, he did this because soft matter physicists have some ideas about how things vibrate. Okay, and these ideas are behind the ones that I told you about with detecting the, the floppy versus rigid clusters through vibrational mode analysis. Okay. And the important thing is that things that are squished together, so under high pressure versus not very squished together under low pressure, okay, actually have a different spectrum, okay and a different a number of modes in that spectrum, depending on how compressed they are. And this number is called the density of vibrational modes. A solid state physicist would call it density of states. This famous Debye scaling is what you're seeing here, if that's something you know. Okay, and this is from Zorana Jarad's six PhD thesis. It's just a really loving example, example of it. And so this increased number of low frequency modes, so if you are counting how many different ways you can vibrate at low frequency, Systems that are floppy have a lot more of them, okay? And we had previously seen in experiments that the same was true, okay? So PhD work of Eli Owens, that as we um, went from a unsquished to a squished system, this population of low frequency modes changed, okay? So what um, Ted saw in the lab was that as we approached the point where things were gonna fail, there were changes in the populations of modes, okay? Um, so this begs the question, we may not be able to see the forces out in the real world, but we may be able to listen to them <laughs> and understand that the vibrational modes are changing and that they are a way of detecting things. Okay, and so this is a new project. Again, not ready to, nothing to share yet, <laughs> like a couple of things I've told you about. Um, actually, I see Vashan is on the call now too. And so we are trying to take this out in the field and see if it will work. Um, but certainly because we saw that the rigid clusters in the lab were, could be identified by this, it's extremely promising. All right, so some general conclusions. Um, so clearly, the more physics, the more you know about the interactions between the parts of your system, the better you can model the details, you will get a better understanding, okay? And so this is why, we, so we're working with a range of things uh, because sometimes we have more details and sometimes we have fewer details, okay? And one of the things we've learned is that simple models can be really effective and that network topology, which is among the most basic things that you know, right? It's not even physics almost, right? Um, is a really strong control sometimes, okay? And therefore doing things with reduced models is successful, sometimes surprisingly successful given how little information you put into it. Okay, so those are just some very general conclusions. Okay, so what, could we take this into a geophysical context? So I've given some hints. 
Um, so in our plastic lattices, we saw that these network measure called centrality could identify likely failure locations, right? I think these are, this is something that should be taken into a lot broader range of materials, right? For instance, on fault networks, things like that. Okay, and Ahmed probably has things to say about that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, in our grains, um, we saw that there were dramatic changes in the structure of network communities shortly before, I said before twice, before, before failure. Um, and so this is something also that if you can write a network model, you may be able to see changes there. I told you guys about this wonderful thing called the pebble game. I love it because it underlies my understanding of rigidity. I don't think it's terribly helpful in a geophysical context, except if you have access to really detailed data, okay? But although doing the pebble game may not be useful, what we saw was that we could detect those places also using a vibrational analysis, right? And because we could do that, it gives us hope that some of the things that we're seeing might be identifiable acoustically, which is extremely portable compared to the other thing and works on opaque systems, okay? Um, and the last thing I wanna say <laughs> is that not only are my particles circles, as I've tried to tell you, they're not as bad as you might think, they're also dry, <laughs> right? Um, and why don't I, and so I think a big frontier for people is to think about wet grains. And I think wet grains are fascinating slash difficult where those are synonyms for a very important reason. And this has huge implications for landslide stability, right? That if you have dry gains, there's essentially no cohesion. This is from a wonderful review paper from um, almost 20 years ago now. Okay. If you have liquid bridges, this is the sand castle state. The liquid bridges glue the particles together and it can be quite rigid. But if you add too much water, the whole thing destabilizes, right? So when you're talking about systems where there is rain involved and hydrology and evaporation, you can be going from the rain stabilizing to the rain destabilizing <laughs> by the amount of rain. And understanding what that does to rigidity criteria, I have no idea. <laughs> and so I just think that's a really wonderful challenge out there um, to be worked on. And the last thing I wanna say, go is that I can only do all of what I do, A, because I have had so many amazing collaborators and students um, who have you know, been, hopefully you've seen all of their pictures and remember them and we'll meet them at future conferences. Um, but also some of my friends are virtual friends um, and you know, part of a community of people who publish open science tools, whether it's their data or their toolboxes. Um, I, am no net, I am no expert in network science. I am an expert in having friends who are experts in network science. Um, and people publishing their open toolboxes, and we have contributed these to the world, these are ones that I benefited from, um, makes us all much more able to do amazing science than any of us could do um, by ourselves. And so with that, I'll go back to my, my general conclusions, which I think are the most interesting. Thanks.